Jackie Robinson, um, I did my master's thesis on Jackie Robinson, and I've been studying him for a good 23 years now. And he is, I think, probably one of the most important characters in American 20th century history. And I think it's probably the most important person in baseball history. And the one issue that I've had on his story is that people see him solely as a pioneer, a baseball pioneer, but not really a pioneer in the civil rights movement. And I think we need to put everything in, in its proper context. And I, and I have a question for you. And you know, you, you gotta ask yourself when you're talking about Jackie Robinson, what would, what would possess a man to put himself through a literal hell day after day after day. Not really because of his political leanings, his religion, his uh, play on the field, but solely based on the color of his skin. And I've tried to think about this question for a very long time and I've long tried to find an answer. I've seen the documentaries, I've read many books, but I thought I found an answer in, uh, in poetry by uh, Robert Frost. And on a poem that we all are familiar with, The Road Not Taken. And if you bear with me, uh, if you can indulge me, I'd like to read that poem for a second. Two roads diverge in the yellow wood, and so sorry I could not travel both. And being one travel long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other side just as fear, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted where, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trod in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall, shall, shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two, world, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. L listen to that. Two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that, that has made all the difference. And when we talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about, and rightfully so, Dr. King, Mega Revis, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X. But we need to think about what Jackie Robinson did. Because before Rosa Parks stepped on that boat, that bus, before the march on Washington with Dr. King, before the speeches of Malcolm X, before Muhammad Ali won, won his first title, Jackie Robinson, Jackie Robinson stood alone. And it was the first time that baseball led American society, intersected in that pivotal year in 1947, and led American society and set American society leading um, baseball. And if you have a good sense of American history, I ask that you look at Jackie Robinson, just not as a pioneer, but as a true American icon. The phrase, you don't belong here. I mean, how many times in American history has this statement clouded the path of progress? And the echo of this statement, whether said in, in a reference to an individual's race, religion, or ethnic background. Jackie Robinson heard this his entire life as a child, as a student at Pasadena College and in UCLA, in the Army, which we're going to talk about, naturally on the baseball diamond, and even later in life. But that statement also drove a person like Jackie Robinson and drove him to excel. When we talk about the plight of the America, African Americans in the, in, in the 18th and 20th century, I think Ralph Ellison says it, says it best in, 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 his, uh, in his book, The Invisible Man. I am an invisible, I am a man of substance, flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might be said to possess a mind I am invisible, I understand simply because people refuse to see me. And that was true. There were two societies in, in, this, in this country. There was one black and there was one white. It was the law of the land, Plessy versus Ferguson, Supreme Court decision. 
And white America just chose to ignore the plight of the African American. And Ellison captures that in that statement in, in this famous book. I unfortunately, like many, are a perpetually frustrated Red Sox fan. And prior to 2004's glorious championship, Red Sox hadn't won one since 1918, the year before they sold, Red, um, before they sold Babe Ruth to the uh, Yankees. And the story is a, is a somewhat famous one. It's really a sham tryout. And this one event in the lack of securing Negro League talent, it was a, a professional baseball league, before any other major league team, and that because they're the last team to integrate them, the last team to, in the majors to integrate, would haunt them for their entire existence. The sham tryout happened on April 16th, 1945. There was Jackie Robinson from the Kansas City Mon uh, Monarchs, Marvin Williams from the Philadelphia Stars, and Sam Jethro for the Cleveland, Bu Cleveland Buckeyes. And the upper management for the Red Sox were not present at this, including the manager, Joe Cronin. And they said, you know, from all accounts, that Jackie Robinson really shone, did very well, hitting the ball off the green mound time and time again, and never got a call. When you think about Jackie Robinson, I mean, they had Bobby Doerr, the Hall of Famer, established at second base. Maybe move Doerr over to first and have Jackie Robinson play second with Ted Williams in left. Think about how that would have changed the franchise where he would be the first for a pipeline of talent coming into Boston. So the issue of race is really the fight for equality in the 20th century. And professional baseball is no different. The famous um, historian and activist W.E. Du Bois would always say that race would be the issue of the 20th century. And when we talk about race, we talk about segregation, which is an act or practice of keeping people or groups apart. Integration is an act or practice of making facilities open to all peoples of all races and sexes. And, you know, looking, we're in the, you know, the third decade now of the 21st century, segregation seems really foreign to us, but the issue of race is not. Racism in American society is nothing new. The black codes were passed um, by Southern state legislatures prior after the Civil War to restrict the rights of former slaves and continue white hegemony. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 was a Supreme Court decision that basically split American society into two, one black, one white, and it legalized segregation. So the idea would be that you'd have two schools, one black, one white. And the money that would be going to the white school for books and desks and facilities and teachers, et cetera, would be the same amount of money that would go to the black school. And we all know that they never transpired. And you know, Jim Crow were unwritten laws that segregated every aspect of the African American life. And professional baseball was really no different. And when you think of the movement, the civil rights movement of the 20th century, who really comes to mind? And what I'm asking is that this talk tonight looks at it differently and puts Jackie Robinson into that proper context. It's Dr. King and, and Megar Evers. It's Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and, and Rosa Parks, all icons for the fight for racial equality in all heroes rightfully so with the movement. But what about Jackie Robinson? But in April of 47, Jackie Robinson's presence on the baseball field in Major League Baseball proved to all in a post-war America that a black man could play in a level playing field with whites. Seven years before Brown versus the Board of Education, Robinson would be the first African-American first man of color to, to wave his wooden stick at a white man and not be lynched for it. And now you're aware that there are more books written about Jackie Robinson than there are Dr. King. So maybe that gives you a hint as to where he is or he stands in American history. 
Shortly before his death in 1968, Dr. King said that Jackie Robinson made my success possible. Without him, I would never have been able to do what I did. And even, you know, Dr. King, who symbolizes the civil rights movement, he's honoring Jackie Robinson. I mean, if you take a look at this chart, and call it the civil rights, the American civil rights tree. Plessy versus Ferguson is at the top, 1896. And right under it, I put down Jackie Robinson, that, that cross section, and he debuts for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The US Army is desegregated in 48. Brown versus the Board of Education in 54. Little Rock 9 in 57, Rosa Parks is in 55. Pumpsy Green debuts for the Boston Red Sox in 59. Greensboro 4 in, in, in uh, 1960. The March on Washington, the integration of Alabama, and then finally the Civil Rights Act in, in 1964. When Jackie Robinson debuted for the, for the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, Dr. King was in college. And in the summer of 49, he, uh, he, just, he gave his first prepared sermon in his father's church in Atlanta. So this gives you an idea as to how he was smashing that color barrier long before it set in to the American psyche. Jackie Robinson was a hero to many and a threat to some. You see that on the far right images of Ben Chapman, who was the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies or more or less a second division team and that weren't that good. Notorious for torturing Jackie Robinson with epithets and slights and uh, they're holding a baseball bat because they wouldn't shake hands. This is Jackie Robinson talking with Dr. King and, and, and providing some advice. And then there's Willie Mays, probably the best all around ball player of all time. And, and Jackie Robinson would uh, try to help these young ball players after him. And that's what he was. He was a leader. And Jackie Robinson's legacy continues. And these men all transcended their particular arena. Willie O'Ree of the Boston Bruins is a Hockey Hall of Famer, the first man of color to play in the National Hockey League in, in uh, January of 1948. And we just saw in the Boston Globe that the Bruins are going to retire his number. It's been postponed because of COVID till next year. He'll be up in the rafters. The greatest winner in professional sports history is, is uh, Bill Russell, um, the great Celtic Hall of Famer. Ernie Davis from Syracuse University, the first black man to win the Heisman Trophy in 1961. And then there's Pumpsy Green, the first black man to play for the Boston Red Sox, to be debuting in July of 1959. But racism, make no mistake, racism isn't just a black and white issue. Racism in its, all its ugly forms has been part of the social fabric of this country since the founding of Jamestown. And these images that I've put on the screen are just a sample of the typical forms of racism in the Bicon area. No, no ethnic group escaped. I'm a third generation uh, American of Italian descent. So that's why I put the, um, the one of the Italian in the middle. And when you take a look at these images, they all will probably, uh, you'll probably be reminded from your old social studies and history classes what ugly racism could look like. A sports, the uh, mirror image of American society? I believe so. I think sports, particularly baseball, treats everyone equally on a level playing field. And it provides everyone with the opportunity to overcome prejudices in one's surroundings to become successful. Because sports, in sports, it's talent that counts, talent above all. And, you know, you hear, you hear from, um, you hear and read stories of the early 20th century and all these children, you know, who were, you know, children of immigrants. Um, and they felt that they were more American when they played the American game. It could be the DiMaggio brothers, Hank Greenberg, the great Jewish star who grew up in New York. Uh, you hear these stories over and over again that, um, you know, they, they went out and baseball was a city game. So these kids would be playing in the streets or a vacant lot or in the back, you know, between the alley. 
playing the, the national pastime because they wanted to be more American. And if you were a good ball player and uh, you were of a different race, we didn't care, we want you on our team. And racism is as American as baseball. And this photo was taken at um, Fenway Park. Now, if you take a look at this photo, every photo of a team before 1947, all the team photos looked alike. And what do they all have, have in common? Look at those pictures. And sometimes you don't see what's staring you right in the face. There's not one person of color. There's no one person of color. Now, I talked about Plessy versus Ferguson and the creation of a separate but equal two societies. And baseball would be no different. And the Negro Leagues was the largest owned professional, major league professional baseball um, enterprise, largest own, black owned enterprise in the United States. They had baseballs, baseball players from across the nation and they were just as good, if not better than their white counterparts. And in December 2020, <clears throat> the Commissioner of Major League Baseball finally recognized the Negro Leagues as a full-fledged major league on par with professional Major League Baseball. And they had teams in Cuba, New York, Kentucky, Alabama, Texas, Wisconsin, Washington, all across this, um, this country. And Brooklyn was a unique situation. I mean, Brooklyn, and by the 1940s, was very diverse community. The population was just over a million, the borough of New York. But this back black population was probably about 1.69% or 23,000 uh, individuals. The Asian population was a mere 0.06%. But foreign born was 33.23%. Think about that number, 33% foreign born, living in this richly diverse community. You know, Hank Greenberg was a stellar baseball player, a two-time MVP and uh, a baseball Hall of Famer. He was a child of Romanian Orthodox Jews who, um, who moved to Bron the Bronx and that's where he was raised. And he was really the first great Jewish baseball star. And during his long career, Greenberg um, suffered a lot of anti-Jewish racism on the field and off. And as a baseball player, the way he carried himself and how he was successful in the field, he was really seen as the baseball version of Moses. And all the names were, were thrown at, at uh, Greenberg, like, like Kike and Shiny, and um, he persevered. And in his last season, um, he got traded to Pittsburgh in 1947. Um, his last year would happen to be Jackie Robinson's first year. You know, and, and when Greenberg was on the scene in the 1930s, that was the height of anti-Semitism, you know, National Socialist, but it was an era of anti-Semitism, not just in Europe, but in, uh, in the United States. And, um, you know, Greenberg was a, was a first baseman and um, you're involved in every play of the game. And Jackie Robinson had an infield hit and ran into Greenberg and they, and they, uh, they collided. They both went down. And Greenberg got him up and talked to him. Greenberg said to Jackie Robinson, don't pay attention to these guys who are trying to make it hard for you. Greenberg said, stick in there. I hope that you and I can get together for a talk. There are a few things I've learned down through the years that might help you make it easier. And when they asked Robinson about what did Greenberg say to you? He says, he gave me encouragement. Mr. Greenberg is, is all class. And you can see in the quote here, Greenberg says, I didn't know what having it bad was until I started with Jackie Robinson. Greenberg could blend. He could hide because of his color of his skin. Jackie Robinson couldn't do that. Racism in baseball, definitely separate but equal. And there are characters in the game. There are various players and owners who perpetuated this whole idea of a color line. There was a gentleman's agreement an unwritten agreement of the National Association of Baseball Players that barred Negro League ball players from professional Major League Baseball. 
So by 1988, by 1895, no white teams fielded a black player. And there are Hall of Famers that um, help perpetuate this stuff. Kennesaw Mountain Lannis is the hero and saved professional baseball after the Black Sox scandal. He not only kept cleaned up professional baseball, but he kept it white. And during World War II, with the team suffering from a talent drain, some owners were tempted uh, to uh, maybe uh, scour the Negro Leagues and um, pick up and recruit some of those players. And, the, and the, um, one owner, Bill Veck, the famous owner, was seeking to uh, purchase the Philadelphia Phillies, but he let it know that he was going to stock it with Negro League players, and he was never given the opportunity to, to buy that team or buy that franchise. Cappy Anson was, another, was a Hall of Famer for the Chicago White Sox. And Sol White, a Hall of, Negro League Hall of Famer, said, just why Anson was so strongly opposed to color players on white teams cannot be explained. His repugnant feeling shown in every opportunity to a colored players, players as a source of comment throughout every league in the country in his opposition with his great power and popularity in baseball circles hastened the exclusion of the black man from the white game. And how do you characterize racism in baseball? One's a physical barrier, an object that prevents a person from moving forward. And there's a conceptual barrier, the idea or belief that keeps a person from moving forward. And there's plenty of both in baseball. But everything changes. And there are two events in American society that would definitely change the racial attitudes of America. It's the rise of the black athlete in the 1930s. Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, is considered one of the greatest heavyweight champions of all time. And, and, and Jesse Owens dominated the Nazi Olympics of 1936. And his, his success challenged Adolf Hitler's theme of a superior Aryan race. World War II and its after effect. World War II not only help preserve freedom and quality in the world, it was a war against the largest racist in American history. Because Hitler and his war machine of hate, Americans began to reevaluate their beliefs. So like here, it's two Americas, one black, one white, and blacks were excluded from parks and beaches and playgrounds and restrooms and bus seats and theaters and libraries, hospital floors, and certain sections of restaurant, which is just unimaginable today. And Jonathan Egan, is, in his great book, Opening Day, says that Jackie Robinson showed that talent mattered more than skin color, supplying a blueprint for the segregation of a nation. But one, no, one man doesn't act alone. And Branch Rickey was the architect of this. He was the guy that was pulling the strings. And when he joined the, the Brooklyn Dodgers, his belief was to, I'm going to, I'm going to, do something that's right. Ricky, there were two things about Ricky, who was a Methodist and trained lawyer. Number one, he loved doing what was right. And number two, he loved to make money. And he knew that if he brought in Negro League talent, they could change the fortunes of the Brooklyn Dodgers and they would be perennial winners. And he was right. And, you know, Ricky was a baseball lifer and he was a good businessman and built the, um, the, the farm system and made the St. Louis Cardinals perennial winners. And he knew that to do this, to challenge the race line in baseball, he needed the right person, a person that could handle the stress and the strain of being a flag carrier for their race. And, and Jack Robinson wasn't the first choice. He had sent his scouts throughout the Negro Leagues and they looked at Roy Campanella, they looked at Satchel Page, they looked, at, uh, they looked at Monty Urban, some great Negro League players who were in their prime or past their prime, who could maybe uh, smash the color barrier. But he kept on hearing about this guy named Robinson. And who is Jackie Robinson? Jackie Robinson was the son of a sharecropper and the grandson of a slave. He was born in Cairo, Georgia, and grew up in Pasadena, California. And his name is Jack Roosevelt Robinson, which is a tribute to the uh, progressive president, Theodore Roosevelt. He was an all around athlete and uh, was a four, letter, four, four star athlete in UCLA. 
he uh, had a shot temper, shot fuse, and played to win. He was a special man, and he was a very different man. And in the great book by Jules Tiger, Baseball's Great Experiment, he talks about the type of ball player that Jackie Robinson was, if you can just bear with me. Ricky had given careful thought about the type of man he required for the role. The candidate did not have to be the best black ball player. Rather, he had to be the most likely to maintain his talents at a competitive peak while withstanding pressure and abuse. He needed the self-control to avoid reacting to his tormentors without sacrificing his dignity. The initial black player would probably spend several years in the minor leagues before making anyone over 30 a risky population. I mean, risky prop proposition. How can a man with a distinctive personality successfully kept it unscraped with constant absorption of attacks calculated to absorb his self-respect? In addition to his composure on the field, the candidate had to be exemplary individual off the field as well. We could know about his, we could know about his ability in uniform, reason Ricky, but what about outside the uniform? his associates, his character, his education, his intelligence. When Ricky had completed the portrait of the ideal pathbreaker, he concluded there were just not very many such humans. But he found that in Jackie Robinson. He is a man who was college educated, was a terrific athlete, and served his country in the army. He is, he could be the one. Now, Jackie Robinson dealt with that whole idea of you don't belong here his entire life. And he was a second lieutenant assigned to the 761st Tank Division, Tank Battalion, also known as the Black Panthers. And um, they would eventually go to Europe and serve under um, General Patton. And um, well, at Fort Hood in Texas, Jackie Robinson, they boarded a bus and he sat next to a woman who was a friend of his I think the wife of a friend of his, and um, she had fair, fair skin. She looked white, but she wasn't white. Robinson had also known that um, the, the buses had been desegregated or something to that effect, um, a transportation on army bases. And the bus driver told Robinson to move. And he said, I'm not gonna move. He says, you have to move. Robinson says, I'm not moving. And they got into it. They got into a shouting mass. And then people on the bus started yelling and screaming at Robinson as well. The bus pulled over and the MPs came and arrested him. And, um, you know, they asked him some questions and he was brought up on charges as a court martial. And Robinson was court martialed. And he said that he, um, he understood that, you know, he could ride the bus, that they were wrong, that the MPs and the bus driver was wrong. And uh, he ended up getting, he got off but he had enough of the army and he got an honorable discharge and he never ended up serving in, uh, in World War II on the front lines because uh, he got that honorable discharge. And I'm using the great experiment because that's really what this is. When we talked about Thomas Jefferson a year ago and, and you know, that whole issue about him in, in, in slavery there are preconditioned notions that you might have about any particular thing. Um, it could be material, immaterial, you know, ideology. And there were preconditioned notions in this country that blacks were inferior. The black ink leaked from the skin of, of black people. And that's why they won't go in the pool. And when we take a look at this pyramid that I have, you have the preconditioned notions, you have the fear of the unknown, and, and, and you know, the fear of something different, and then there's the threat. Because it's a threat to your daily life and the change that's coming. But think about it as a baseball player, it's the threat that this person is going to take my job, that I'm an outfielder and he's gonna come and take my job. So now, I have a different type of competition. And if Robinson is successful, 
who else is going to come into the league and maybe I'm going to lose my job. Well, I think I just went back. So in 1946, Brain Tricky signs Jackie Robinson to play for the Montreal Royals. And he and John Wright, who's a pitcher, they made the history for the more Royal, the Royals that end up winning the um, Little League World, the Little World Series for AAA. And uh, Campanon Don Newcomer signed to the Dodgers affiliate in Nashua, New Hampshire. Sorry. After a successful year where Robinson is MVP and brings the Royals to a championship, he is contract is bought out by the Brooklyn Dodgers. He is promoted to the Brooklyn Club. And he's going to star as a first baseman um, for the Dodgers that year. And he's getting ready to make his debut on the 15th um, of April 1947 against the Boston Braves. And there's a petition going around for the Brooklyn Dodgers started by Dixie Walker, who was a Southerner, and um, is in cahoots with the St. Louis Cardinals. And there's a rumor that if Robinson is in the lineup, the National League is going to go and strike in opposition to Jackie Robinson. And some Dodgers players sign a petition, they bring it to Brain Trick and say, we don't want to play with this guy. This guy doesn't belong here. Oh, I want to be traded. And um, the strike is inverted. The strike is inverted. And Robinson would say that I'm not concerned with your liking me or disliking me. All I ask is respect me as a human being. And he was such a gifted athlete that he just captured Americans of all races. And he understood his role. And he understood there were those that supported him and those that just wanted him to fail. And he understood that. But really, what was the cost to him? Jackie Bolt Robinson in 1947, he was the only black man on a field with white men. He played out of position the entire season. He was playing for his base, which meant he had came into contact with every play, meaning he got knocked down, he got stepped on, he got spiked, he got yelled at, and it, it took a huge physical toll. And, and the pressure to be perfect, that he could not fail, or the whole experiment would, would collapse. So in essence, the whole race was on his shoulders. In adding to that stress, there's a constant threat of personal safety and the safety for his family and letters like this coming to him daily. And, 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 and just a little tidbit here, Robinson led the National League in getting hit by pitches once, was second four times and third twice. He was a perpetual target. But Jackie's secret weapon is his wife Rachel and they always say that behind every successful man is a great woman and I, I believe that and Rachel Robinson was a pioneer in her own right um, a trained nurse a UCLA graduate um, she was there with him every step of the way and, and Ricky asked him he goes do you have a woman and he says yeah I'm engaged and he says you better marry her because you're going to need her. And Rachel Robinson was the, uh, you know, where the spring training was the only wife allowed at spring training because Jackie needed that. And Rachel would talk about, you know, going to the baseball game and she'd be at every game. Even when she had their son, Jackie Jr., she'd bring him to the game or have a babysitter. So on their walk home from the game, they would talk about what happened during that game. So when they got home, it was just about them and the baby. And they didn't talk about work. So it just allowed them to enjoy each other, enjoy, enjoy their family. We know that there was the triumph of, of Jackie Robinson. And, you know, everyone was always well asking, how's Jackie doing? He initiated a new style of baseball, at this, the Negro League trickery, of dancing off the bases, hiding the ball. He made the game faster, a game that you hadn't seen since the days of of uh, Ty Cobb. He energized. Baseball had become energized. And people were always asking about, asking about Jackie Robinson. And his exploits would um, help propel the Dodgers to the, to the World Series. And Jackie Robinson's voted the first National League Rookie of the Year in 1947. He had 42 successful bunts, 15, 14 for hits, 28 sacrifices, 29 stolen bases, 12 home runs, 
in a 297 batting average. And, and he, he changed baseball, how baseball and society change. I'm 69 years old, but never thought I'd live to see the day when I stand face to face with Ty Cobb and Technico. That's from Bill Bunjangles Robinson in a great book, Bums, an oral history of the Brooklyn Dodgers by Peter Golem book. They talk about that change in society. And it says, in one incredible year, in the face of unanimous opposition, Jackie Robinson had proved that the Negro could not only compete in the major leagues, but he could sparkle. Because he was so spectacular, there was a rush by other teams to sign black talent. The others were limited, however, by the fact that Branch Rookie had gotten a significant head start on them. Coming to the Dodgers would be Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, Joe Black, and Junior Gillum. And other teams, Monty Irvin, Don, Larry Doby, Hank Thompson, and San Jethro would soon appear. Black stars from Willie Mays to Hank Aaron to Reggie Jackson would someday follow. All because of the courage and dignity and skill and intelligence of Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Around the country, especially in the South, Jackie Robinson became much more than just a great ball player. Became a savior. And what did Jackie Robinson's success usher in? It ushered in change. The change, the clouds of change are coming, the, or the clouds of a storm. And however you see it, the change is coming. And in, in, in Jack's success, Jackie's success ushered in a dramatic change in the way the game was played. It changed the for fortune of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And now with Jack, Jackie and other black sides, they became perennial winners. And, and the game became faster. The bases were stolen. And it just became a better all around game. And I like this quote, life is not a spectacular, spectator sport. If you're going to spend your whole life in the grandstands just watching what goes on, in my opinion, you're wasting your life. And, and, and Ken Burns, the great documentarian who wrote, who did a great documentary on Jackie Robinson, said that, you know, he, that Robinson was an uncompromising crusader. <clears throat> and the social experiment, this great experiment was really a social experiment. And if we start with baseball and that's successful, then the military is gonna be next. And then the American school system, and then American society. So Jackie Robinson's success meant that other barriers in American society would soon be integrated. And, and Dr. King would say that Jackie Robinson was a sit-inner before sit-inners, a freedom rider before freedom rides. And his number, 42, what does it stand for? I think it stands for hope. It means that no matter who you are or where you come from or the color of your skin, you can achieve your dreams no matter how different you are. Now back to that Burns documentary. Um, there's a story that uh, a young man who's, who's an older man now talks about with his dad. And you know, it was a big treat when they got a chance to go to the baseball game. And his father was deaf. <coughs> and they had read all about Jackie Robinson. And they went to a baseball game. And um, you know, his, his son, was responsible, his father come home from work and he would say, you know, he'd tell his son, tell me what happened to the game. So when they would listen on the radio, the son would be signing to his dad about what was transpiring. So at the baseball game they attended, Jackie Robinson got knocked down and some ruckus happened on the field and everyone starts booing. And the father started screaming in the voice that he had because he was deaf and people started looking at him and saying, what is this noise, this horrible noise, the screeching and the son seemed embarrassed and he said he goes my father called called me out on it because he saw that and he said it dawned on him that you know his father always came home always came home from work angry and he figured that he was probably because he got slighted maybe at work maybe on the bus or the train or whatever and my father was different and jackie robinson was different so he felt for jackie robinson and jackie robinson became his hero because he was just as different as Jackie Robinson and understood what he was going through. And, and that's how Jackie Robinson transcends this game, how he becomes this icon. Robinson 
during his career and uh, mostly in retirement is at the forefront. He never gave up the fight and the celebrity youth fight and racism. Uh, he took action, marching and speaking for equality. But later in life, he'd be seen as being out of touch, being an Uncle Tom. Can't believe that. He would he would write it for a, news, a syndicated newspaper column and openly discuss matters pertaining to race, religion, race uh, sorry race relations, politics, and family life. And uh, always talked about the current state of race relations. And you know, not everyone agreed with him. To his dismay, a lot of people were amazed that he threw his support in the 1960 presidential race behind uh, Richard Nixon, feeling that the Kennedys weren't really serious about race relations. Jackie Robinson would go work for Chuck Full of Nuts and uh, had multiple interests and was a co-founder of the Freedom National Bank in Harlem, which would be the largest black business on uh, in New York State. And uh, this represented economic independence for the, uh, the black population. Robinson's legacy from 1949 to 16, 1969, over a 22 year period, 16 National League MPs were awarded to black ballplayers. The American League, lost, which was a lot slower to integrate, only had two black ballplayers win MVP in 1963 and 66. From 1947 to 1969, 13 Rookie of the Year awards were given to black ballplayers. Frank Robinson, who you see here, was the first black manager in Major League Baseball when he was hired by the Cleveland Indians in 1975. But what is the Robinson effect? It continues to this day. Hank Aaron, who is still seen by many, um, is uh, in the hearts of baseball players, still the home run champ with 755 home runs. And what he went through, smashing an iconic Babe Ruth record and the death threats that he went through. Uh, Kurt Flood, a perennial all-star with the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, World Series champion, was traded to the uh, Philadelphia Phillies refused to uh, report. Before free agency, before the big dollars, there was a thing called the reserve clause that bound a baseball player to their team for the life of their, their career. And uh, Kerr Flood refused to, to report. And he would say that he was a well-paid well paid slave in his book, his famous book, but he wasn't gonna report and he gave up his career. He fought in the Supreme Court and he lost but he paved the way for free agency several years later, later. And then Bob Watson, who was a terrific baseball player in his own right and played a season for the Red Sox, uh, would become the first black general manager in Major League Baseball and was the architect of those Yankee, that Yankee dynasty uh, that won multiple championships in the 1990s. But Robinson, the man, he, you know, on his tombstone, it says a life is not important except the impact that it has on uh, other lives. And his impact was great. His success paved the way for other black ball players. 1947, National League Rookie of the Year. 1949, um, National League MVP. 1955, World Champion. Um, he began a renaissance with the Brooklyn Dodgers, as rookie predict, as uh, Branch Rookie predicted. Six National League pennants and one World Series title. He became the first African American to be elected into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962, and in 1997. Uh, the 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary of him smashing that color barrier in baseball. His uh, number 42 was retired by baseball in perpetuity. And today, Major League Baseball is uh, really a melting pot. And you take a look at the baseball players here, that represents uh, all the different ethnic backgrounds that is Major League Baseball. I never had it made, which is interestingly the title of Jackie Robinson's biography. And he says, I cannot salute the flag. I know that I'm a black man in the white world. In 1972, 1947, and at my birth in 1919, I know that I never had it made. And Jackie Robinson died very young. He died in 1972 at the age of 53. He was blind in one eye, uh, suffering from heart disease, diabetes, and loss of good circulation in his legs. And the amputation of his legs was really real. But think about that. Uh, he's so fast and his, you know, he was a great football player and a basketball player and a track star and a basketball player, but it was his legs that were giving out on him. And a lot of people believe that the stress um, of playing baseball during that early period really did a job on his body. 
in, you know, in Reverend Jesse Jackson said at, um, in his wake, his funeral, I'm going to read this. Today, we, we must balance the tears of sorrow with the tears of joy. Mix the bitter with the sweet and depth in life. Jackie is a figure in history, was a rock in the water, creating concentric circles and ripples of new possibility. He was medicine. He was immunized by God from catching the disease that he fought. The Lord's arms of protection enabled him to go through the dangers seen and unseen, and he had the capacity to wear glory with grace. Jackie bought, Jackie's body was a temple of God, an instrument of peace. We would watch him disappear into nothingness and stand back as spectators and watch the suffering from afar. The mercy of God intercepted this process Tuesday and permitted him to steal away home where the referees are out of place and only the supreme judge of the universe speaks. Now, Jackie Robinson only played 10 years in the major leagues. Lifetime average of 311, average about 30, 85 runs per year, hit 15 home runs in an average of 24 stolen bases. In 1987, they mentioned that as a, of a player survey, that Robinson was voted the greatest of his era at second base. And when we talk about Robinson, the adjectives we use to describe him were fearless, courageous, dynamic, defiant, proud, and aggressive. And where is, major, where is baseball, Major League Baseball today? Well, in, every April, April 15th is Jackie Robinson Day, where by, baseball players throughout... Um, Major League Baseball honor Jackie by wearing his number 42. For those gamers in the crowd, um, with Sony, the Jackie Robinson Foundation has partnered with the Sony Interactive Entertainment and has created the PlayStation Career Pathways. And they have the new M MLB, the Show 21 Collector's Edition. And the program will offer proceeds from this game, uh, will offer scholarships, mentorships, internships, and support for students from unrepresented groups. But how here as uh, New Englanders in Boston Red Sox fans, how do we feel about the Jackie Robinson experiment? Well, we're forever linked with it, particularly Jackie and, and, and Pumpsy Green. And Green's arrival integrating the Boston Red Sox in 1959, which is the last team to integrate is the bookend event to Robinson's tryout 15 years later. And that's a tough, that's a tough pill to swallow. And back to Jonathan Eag, he writes, the curse of the Bambino, the curse of racism. He goes, for all the talk about Boston's curse of the Bambino, but the notion that the Red Sox went 86 years without a World Series is sort of karmic punishment for trading Babe Ruth in 1919. The curse of Jackie Robinson hurt them more. And how would things have been different? The, Giants, the Red Sox were the first to scout Willie Mays. And think about that. Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays in the same team with Ted Williams and Bobby Doerr and some others. How would that have changed the fortunes of our beloved Red Sox? And who's to blame? Is it Tom Yawkey, the aloof owner? Joe Cornyn, the manager, Eddie Collins, the general manager, Pinky Higgins, who's also general manager and coach. There's a whole host of people to blame. Well, the Red Sox have had stellar, stellar um, talent, all-star talent, black ball players. Reggie Smith, Jim Rice, Roger Morale, Mo Vaughn, Mo Mookie Betts, so forth. The list goes on and on. But the wilderness years, when we didn't have a champ championship, <clears throat> how long has that uh, haunted us. And it's an issue that's happening <coughs> to, this, to this day when you take a look at the uh, our beloved Red Sox and the color of the Red Sox. Jackie Bradley Jr., who uh, was an, is an African-American, is no longer on the Red Sox. So the issue of racism continues to haunt our beloved Old Town team. So I want to thank you uh, for joining me tonight to hear me talk about my passion Baseball, I love baseball. I'm looking forward to uh, the baseball season and patiently waiting for uh, even spring training, Nesson games to come aboard. And I hope that uh, everyone remains safe. And um, I'm opening it up for questions. Thank you, Jen.
Great talk as always. Thank you, Jen. If anybody wants to ask a question, you can um, either drop it in the chat or you can unmute and just um, just jump in. What was your what was your um, opinion of the Forty Two movie? Um, I liked it. I, I thought I didn't know who Chadwick Bos Boseman was. I don't think anyone did at that time. And I remember going to the movie theater with my wife <clears throat> to watch it. And I'm watching this guy, and I'm saying to myself, he is capturing everything that I've read and studied about Jackie Robinson. So I thought that his dynamism, he was such a dynamic actor, uh, and he had athletic ability. Um, I thought he just played Jackie Robinson to a T. Now, Jackie Robinson played himself in the Jackie Robinson story uh, back in the 1950s. Jackie Robinson was a great baseball player, not so much a great actor. But I thought that 42 captured, um, with, you know, it's through a 21st century lens, but I think it really captured what Robinson had to go through in the racism and just the feeling of his own teammates. I mean, they, they really, they were afraid of change. You know, and, and, and then back to Dixie Walker, who was a very popular ball player, very good ball player for the, for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He came from the South and he had a, uh, he had a, um, a convenience store. And people were like, well, you know, what am I going to do when I go back? When I go home and run this convenience store, people are going to say, well, how could you play with a black man? Well, what, are they, he's going to lose business. And that was really real. So, I mean, there's all those preconditioned notions, but there's also that aspect of life that you really, you know, do you have control over it? And um, I thought the acting overall was great. And I was really happy that Han, Han Solo, um, Harrison Ford played Branch Rickey, and I thought he did a good job. <laughs> I thought he did a good job on that. Thank you for asking that question. Any other questions? My favorite Red Sox player, um, Kyle Yastrzemski which was interesting because my father was a Joe DiMaggio fan, naturally being Italian and American. He was a big Joe DiMaggio fan. My mother was a Ted Williams fan and loved Ted Williams. And um, here I am, the young kid, like in the Polish guy from New York. And <laughs> Jastrzemski was my, was my uh, baseball hero. And I would match him up against, uh, against anybody. In terms of, um, I keep getting asked about books to read if you're interested in Jackie Robinson. My baseball Bible in the Jackie Robinson book that I would recommend is Jules Tigel's book, The Great Experiment. It's a great book on history of baseball, um, but it's, it's the definitive, I think, uh, book on him. The Bums that I talked about, an oral history is, is a fun read. Um, Howard Bryant, who used to be uh, a journalist for the Boston Herald, wrote a good book called Shut Out, which is about racism in the Boston Red Sox and Boston, um, in, in Boston society. So that's a, an intriguing read. And um, so I would uh, definitely look at those, um, those books. I'm a, I'm a homer, so I always like to read something that's a little bit more closer to home to get an insight into the um, thinking of fellow Massachusetts citizens. I just got a question in the chat. Was Pee Wee Reese a good friend of Jackie? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And that's the question that's been debated for over 50 years. Um, Pee Wee Reese was uh, from Kentucky, um, and um, he uh, he was fair. He didn't sign the petition, and I think the portrayal of him the, of him in Fire Two is pretty accurate, where he recognized that as listen, the guy is good to play um, and take my job, and so be it. And there's a story about Jackie Robinson when they went to Cincinnati. And um, people were getting on Robinson. And Pee Wee Reese motioned over to him and put his um, arm around him, like, and this and signified to the crowd that you know Robinson's my friend and it's okay. And there's a statue to that moment outside the um, the Reds baseball baseball stadium. You may believe it never happened. That that just had never happened. Um, Rachel Robinson was asked about when they were doing that statue to Pee Wee Reese for Jackie Robinson. She's like, well, I'm not too sure that ever happened. I had a better image of him, but she got voted down. Pee Wee Reese was a great leader of the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was a great ball player and actually had been Red Sox property and was tearing up Louisville, which was a Red Sox affiliate in AAA. And then uh, Joe Cronin, the stubborn, Irish, stubborn Irishman that he was, was at the end, tail end of his career, refused to leave Shotstop, and hence 
Pee Reese got traded to uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. So I think that he was a fa- I think he was a friend of Jackie Robinson as much as a friend could be. I mean, I think it was he a dear friend. I don't think so, but I think he was a friend. And I think you got to remember too is that you know Leo the Lip de Rocha, who was born in Springfield, Massachusetts was the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And um, he had come under a lot of fire for his off the field activities. Leo DeLip was ferocious, he was tough, tough as nails, was a tough baseball player, successful manager. Well, he got banned by Commissioner Happy Chandler with the Commissioner of Baseball at the time uh, for a season for gambling and infidelity. And that was right before the season began. And Branch Rickey was he was dumbfounded that he was going into the season with this black ball player that he knew things were going to already be difficult. Now you're pulling the rug out of me and getting rid of Leo the lip. And um, Brent Rickey had to scramble to find a, find a manager. And he did. So it was just Brent Rickey had a lot of things going on at that, that time. And Ricky was really smart because like with any good politician, he, he made a couple of phone calls to a lot of the black activists and um, the, the black pastors or black ministers saying that you need to talk to your congregations. You need to talk to your people, right? Or your associates. And you need to behave. You don't need to get in trouble. You don't need to stir the pot because your actions are going to uh, be relayed. And we need to make this social experiment successful. And I need you to do that. And um, in the black population, wherever they were, wherever the Dodgers played, the black population went out in droves to see Jackie Robinson. And like I said, Jackie Robinson wasn't just a, a, a hero for um, the black population. He was a hero for a lot of people, a lot of people. And uh, Jarvis Kearns Goodwin, the historian, the presidential historian, um, was a big Brooklyn Dodger fan and um, loved the Dodgers, loved Gil Hodges and Duke Snyder and loved Jackie Robinson. And um, you can see how he just crossed every line. Um, in a positive way. And uh, today he's still, uh, he's, he's such an important f- character in American history. And sometimes, you know, as a history geek and a, his, and a baseball fanatic, I think he, that gets lost and that bothers me because he is so important and we have to look back at history sometimes to see that. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you again. Well, Jen, thank you very much. Yeah.